Dear colleagues, a warm welcome to the third Onco Alert Colloquium, this year being held in partnership with the American Society for Radiation Oncology, the European Cancer Organization, the European Society for Gynecological Oncology, the European Oncology Nursing Society, the European School of Oncology, eCancer, the International Society for Geriatric Oncology, the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, and the Swall Cancer Research Network. Together, we bring you this end of the year review of the Best of Oncology 2022, from trials to publications, drug approvals to current controversies within our field and future trends in treatment and research. This colloquium will last six days from January 23rd to January 28th, 2023. Links will appear on social media and you can always find them via our website, oncoalert360.com. And there you can find the colloquium webpage you will find the possibility to subscribe to our newsletter and we will send you the links daily. This colloquium is independent of any financial support and comes to you as a result of our partners and our faculty working hard in order to drive the field forward, regardless of geography. There is no sign up, no information acquired or tracked. You simply click and watch. We truly hope that you enjoy this colloquium as much as we enjoyed making it. All the presenters have added their Twitter accounts at the bottom, and this was done in order to facilitate networking, contacting, and education. The days are separated by specific tumor groups, and our aim was to give you as much of a multidisciplinary approach as possible. Although we apologize to our surgery colleagues, we promise to have this included for our fourth colloquium. The daily links to the colloquium will be active at 12 noon EST, New York time, and 6 p.m. CET Stockholm time. Once the presentation has been streamed for the day, it will be available to you on demand, and we highly encourage you and thank you for sharing it with all your colleagues at your institution to truly amplify the knowledge coming out of our faculty. Another way of receiving the links daily is always by signing up to our newsletter at www.oncoalert360.com. Today is day six of the colloquium, focusing on the EON sessions, along with EZO and the special presentation for COVID and cancer. Our amazing faculty is Dr. Virpi Sulisari, President-elect of EONS, Meryl Van Klinken, RN of the University Medical Center Utrecht in Netherlands, and Nicolina Dodlek, RN of the University Hospital Center Osijesh in Croatia. Continuing with the ESO sessions on education and improving outcomes by Alexander Inu and Dr. Maha Sendi. Now, without further ado, Ms. Van Klinken. Thank you so much for having this EON session, and thank you for having me presenting something to you about the EON's prevention plan. My name is Merel van Klinken. I am a cancer nurse and a palliative care consultant in a cancer center in the Netherlands. I am also an executive board member of EON's and a co-chair of the advocacy working group. The European Oncology Nursing Society have initiated the PREFCAN project. This is a cancer prevention campaign involving research and education. Its aim is to reach a wide proportion of European population with evidence-based reliable information on how to prevent and reduce cancer risk. This campaign is run with ESMO as a key partner. So why has EONS initiate, initiated this? We know that cancer incidence is increasing globally. WHO estimates that 30 to 50% of cancers are preventable, and EU estimates that 40% of all cancers are preventable. However, cancer prevention still receives little attention in many European countries. The PREFCAN campaign is in line with Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, which aims to improve access and comprehension of cancer risk factors. It also provides information and tools to people so they can make healthier choices. And they have a specific goal of raising awareness among the general public so that at least 80% of EU population are aware of the European Code Against Cancer. The PREFCAN campaign offers great opportunities to impact people's health and to address the extensive problem of cancer-related health literacy which plays such an important role in adopting preventive behaviors. Traditionally, cancer nurses have mostly been involved in secondary and tertiary 
cancer prevention, mainly working with patients and families already affected by cancer during treatment, follow-up, and the survivorship phases. Here, nurses have a unique role in educating, educating patients and their family members and carers on cancer prevention and risk reduction strategies. This works efficiently in some countries already, but better nursing education in cancer prevention is needed to reach out to all people affected by cancer across Europe. Nurses and other healthcare professionals are less frequently involved in primary cancer prevention, intervening with a general public. Here, a more active approach from healthcare professions could have an even larger impact. So why do nurses have a key role in prevention? Up until now, cancer nurses have not had a big role intervening with the general public regarding cancer prevention. Even though nurses are key players in informing and training patients, and for example, self-breast examination or testicle or skin examinations, nurses have a pivotal role in providing lifestyle advice and cancer screening, for example. Also, health literacy has been described as an important factor influencing attendance of cancer screening programs. So during 2020 and 2021, EONS has focused its cancer prevention work on increasing nurses' awareness and knowledge on cancer prevention and on their ability to reach out to subgroups most in need of cancer prevention activities. Thousands of nurses across Europe have been involved in these activities. A number of events have already taken place, such as a webinar series on cancer, lifestyle and safety, different social media campaigns and news articles and joint letters on cancer prevention. Within the PrevCan campaign, we are constantly searching for ways to reach out better and to different groups. This is why we held focus group interviews with young people with and without cancer experience, immigrants and people with learning disabilities. This is also related to how the European Code Against Cancer is perceived. These results will guide and impact the campaign to make a better fit with context-specific needs. This way, chances to reach different groups with cancer prevention messages are optimized. So we are already able to show you some preliminary results from these focus group interviews. We saw that people with learning disabilities know the risk and are trying to live healthy, but are reliant on others who may not be as aware. They say supporting staff are not always supportive and they feel a more positive approach is needed. Immigrants need better information from trusted sources like schools and nurses. They also say they want to talk about benefits of lifestyle changes and not sugarcoat it. They need us to be specific. Young people with no cancer experience say they should not even try to reach out to them using the old media. Influencers can be used, but they would need to be trustworthy and knowledgeable. And like people with learning disabilities, young people want a more positive approach. They don't want to hear what they cannot do. Young cancer survivors feel loneliness when they are with friends. They also experience guilt and shame. They need small step approaches and also positive mess messages. For now, the PrevCan campaign covers a 12-month period. We have provided campaign materials in 25 languages with, which can be downloaded from the website you see below. Different partners are involved in the support and dissemination of materials on social media and other platforms. They are involved in one or more EONS campaign activities and arrange their own prevention activities. During this year, there will be a systematic evaluation. And these are all of the partners I just talked about who are collaborating with us on the prevention campaign. So like I said, every month has a new theme within the cancer prevention. In September 2023, 2022, a PrevCan was launched during the ESMO EONS conference. 
The first month was focused around smoking, which is still the most important risk, risk factor for cancer. Campaign targeted information on e-cigarettes and water pipes as well. Following this, November focused on the risk from secondhand smoking. During this month, we tried to raise awareness on the effects of secondhand smoking, specifically for children and young people, and promoting smoke-free cars, workplaces, and homes. December kicked off with a waistline challenge, which will run through until February. Here, the focus is on the effects of being overweight, obesity, and cancer. I will discuss this a little bit more later. And what's coming up this year? So next to the waistline challenge, January will focus on physical activity and cancer. The campaign will also include a physical activity challenge. February will focus on diet and cancer with a campaign activity including a lunchbox challenge. Attention to this will also be given during World Cancer Day. Next is alcohol and cancer, where we will organize webinars around this topic. April will focus on sun exposure and risk of cancer. Safe workplaces will receive attention in May with the European Cancer Nursing Day and European Cancer Awareness Week to have even more focus on this. June will focus on radon exposure, July on breastfeeding and hormone replacement therapy, August focuses on cancer and vaccines, and lastly, September 2023 will focus on cancer screening and raising the awareness of the benefits. We also aim to educate nurses themselves on risk factors. For example, nurses should be aware of occupational risks, like exposure to hazardous, dr hazardous drugs and radiation. Also, nurses do smoke themselves, although this varies between countries. Studies have shown nurses who smoke are less likely to intervene with smoking patients. Nurses sometimes have problems with diet and weight. We all know the long shifts, unhealthy foods, and the presents we get from patients in the form of cake or sweets. So with the prevention plan, we don't just aim for patients, but also for the nurses. So starting in December and running through until February, which is a good thing, seeing the December month with all of the holidays, um, the Waistline Challenge is set up. This is actually an EONS and an Onco Alert collaboration. The Waistline Challenge is based on Recommendation 3 in the European Code Against Cancer. The aim is to raise awareness on overweight and obesity as risk factors for cancer among the cancer workforce with a positive approach. So key messages are cancer care professionals need to better look after their health, as research indicate highly prevalence of obesity, poor eating habits and insufficient physical activities. So drop belly fat reduces the risk for certain cancers. Overweight and obesity are so associated with increased risk of 13 types of cancer. So keep your waistline for women below 88 centimeters and for men below 102 to reduce, to reduce this risk. Core team within EONS and Encore Alert are being active and sharing their experiences, encouraging and supporting others. Short films can be recorded and uploaded to share progress and difficulties. In January, the focus will be on exercise, like I said. This is next to the waistline challenge. The focus will be on physical activity and cancer. Campaign activity will include a physical activity challenge with the aim of raising awareness among the general public and also healthcare professionals. In this month, there will be special attention for children and young people, so get moving for your health. So what can you do to help us? First of all, join us in our monthly challenges. Use the hashtags and make use of the downloadable toolkits from your, our website in your own language. You can also contact your local media and public health contacts to join in and inform your political stakeholders. Also, you can contact the PrevCan partners in your own country and discuss actions and ways to collaborate. And again, 
look at our prevention toolkits to have access to existing toolkits, but also to create your own messages. So join us for our Waistline Challenge and the upcoming challenges of 2023. I want to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, my contact details are below. Don't hesitate to ask. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, uh, depending on where you are watching and when. My name is Virpu Sulosari. I'm the current president-elect of European Oncology Nursing Society. Hello, everybody. My name is Nicolina Dodlek, and I am European Oncology Nursing Society board member representing Young Cancer Nurses Network. In this three-part series of uh, video recordings, we are going to talk about well-being at work from the nursing perspective. Uh, the three parts include first uh, introduction on the topic and in the second part we are going to look uh, as an example more on compassion fatigue and in the final third part we are going to talk about improving well-being at work. We need to start first by talking about what does well-being at work mean. The concept itself is uh, quite complex. It encompasses an individual's appraisal of physical, social and psychological resources which are needed to meet psychological, physical and social challenges at work. Well-being can be classified to objective well-being or the satisfaction of physical needs, and this refers to basic needs such as food, clothing and shelter, and subjective well-being or emotional and psychological support a person needs to flourish. Nurses' health and well-being are affected by demands of their workplace and their everyday work. And then, in turn, their well-being affects to their work and for people they care for. During the course of their work, nurses encounter physical, mental, emotional and ethical challenges. Nurses are very committed for caring people with diverse and often complex needs of people with competence and compassion. While nursing is often by many nurses called as a calling profession, we need to acknowledge that it is a very demanding profession. Nurses experience excessive levels of burnout and stress due to nature of their work and their working conditions. And when we talk about professional well-being, it's important to understand that it is associated with many uh, factors such as job satisfaction, being able to find meaning and fulfillment in work, feeling engaged and having a high quality work experience. Is it time to act? We argue that it is. We all know that globally and across Europe, we have severe lack of nurses. And for example, uh, between 2020 and 2030, over 1 million nurses will retire. Therefore, retaining nursing workforce and supporting new nurses is vital to growth and sustainability of cancer care workforce. We really need to focus on creating healthy work environments and investing the long careers uh, by uh, well-being at work of nursing uh, workforce. During the recent COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the demands on nurses have been extraordinary due to the, their significant role in infection control, isolation and containment process. However, although COVID-19 imposed new challenges for the profession, it also has offered opportunities to give nurses well-being the attention it really deserves and address the system structures and policies that create workplace hazards and stresses 
that can lead to burnout, fatigue and poor physical and mental health. Nurses uh, experience excessive levels of burnout and stress. They are exposed in their everyday work, challenging job-related stressors, such as extensive workloads, short lengths of stay, constant contact with patient and family suffering, nursing shortages, long working hours, and feelings of powerless regarding job control. The consequences if uh, a person uh, ends up with burnout can include poor patient outcomes, high turnover rates, increased cost, and even clinician illness and suicide. There are also other risks for well being at work. These include incurring the risk of infection and physical or verbal assault, meeting physical demands, managing and supporting the needs of multiple patients, eat complex needs having emotional conversations with patients and families and confronting challenges, social and ethical issues. We also know that there is a high prevalence of occupational injuries among healthcare workers, especially uh, among nurses. These are, for example, needle stick injuries. In oncology, there are specific occupational risks which are related to handling of hazardous drugs and other treatments. As Yurpi already mentioned, in the second part, we are going to speak a little bit more about compassion fatigue. In our everyday work life, we face a lot of challenges clinical, professional, personal, and person's ability to cope with it, it can impact very much our reaction to stressful situations. So Squirrels described that personal quality of life and compassion satisfaction impact very much on creating and resulting compassion fatigue and burnout and also a secondary trauma. He describes compassion fatigue as the convergence of secondary traumatic stress and also cum cumulative burnout. He says that it's a state of physical and mental exhaustion caused by the plapped ability to cope with one's everyday environment and it can be impacted by a lot of different factors, internal and external. Figley in 2012 has described a model of compassion fatigue on the caregivers. He says that the process begins with exposure to the client, his empathic concern response that is based on the empathic ability to cope with a caregiver. He says that traumatic memories and prolonged exposure can result with compassion fatigue, which can cause a life dis disruption. Empathic ability is a cornerstone of the model, caregiver's aptitude for noticing the pain of the others. The concept itself describes burnout and secondary trauma, which lead to compassion fatigue. Compassion is defined as a feeling of having pity or the urgent desire to help or aid somebody, but it can very much impact not only the patient care, but also the relationship with our colleagues and our professional and personal life. Several risk factors can impact our compassion fatigue and ability to cope. They can be both internal and external. Internal ones are our current state of being. Not every person in every moment in life will react the same to some factors which lead to burnout. So we have a physical, emotional, social, but also a spiritual well being. We have resilience, which we build through our life and career and also a person's ability to cope with difficult situations. It's very impo important to develop self-compassion. External factors are more related to the work environment. So most often it's excessive workload, it is difficult shift rotation, but also patients, patients who have pain and who suffer a lot. We have by spurs five stages of compassion fatigue. So the first stage is an early career stage 
when we are enthusiastic and very much motivated for our work, but work overall and all those risk, risk factors can lead us to the second phase, which is called irritability phase. It is a phase of taking shortcuts, avoid colleagues, avoid work, but also avoid the patients. Our enthusiasm is starting to disappear. The third phase, the withdrawal phase, impacts not only professional, but also our personal life. We start to lose compassion for our patients. Our problems are piling up. We don't have ability to cope and it can also lead to leaving the profession. Figli has also developed a smart formula in creating self-care goals. So he says the goals needs to be very specific, both measurable, attainable, realistic, and also time-based. It's important to take baby steps. He has created a smart chart about maintenance, but also growth. So not only to check with ourselves, do we have obstacles and are we resistant to achieving our goals, but also to check with our friends, to ask for help. If yes, what are the obstacles? Check with your body. It's called accountability body to help us to check our goals, the time we need to come to our goals. And the key is self-compassion. We need to be self-kind. It's human to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. So self-care strategy is one of the most important strategies to increase our personal strength and also our resilience and ability to cope. It will be a mindfulness techniques, a help of a friend, a help of a family, but we need to learn self-compassion. Compassion satisfaction is defined as satisf satisfaction experienced by healthcare professionals. When we are performing our work properly, it includes satisfaction with relationship with our colleagues, our workplace, sense that work is performed very well. So the crucial is problem solving, but also seek seeking a social support. It is essential for better cl clinical patient outcomes, but also our personal life. Self-care, we need to have a holistic approach. So try to maintain the balance from professional, but both personal life, because professional and personal are very much connected. One impacts the other. Social connection at work is very important. When we work long hours, night shift, that five to 10 minutes to exchange experiences and difficult situations at work can mean very much for us and for our team. So we need to develop a team strength, a social support at work, and develop situations and chances to discuss those difficult situations and memories. It helps, but we also need support from organization. We need a positive workplace. Is it going to be debriefing once a month or educational events to cope and develop resilience? We need to empower each other and we need to empower ourselves. European Oncology Nursing Society Young Cancer Nurses Network has recorded a Nightingale webinar about compassion fatigue and burnout, resilience and balance, personal and professional life. It is available on EON's YouTube channel, but also at EON's website. So please feel free to look. It was developed especially for early career Young Cancer Nurses Network at start who are just starting their careers so they need to develop resilience strategies and way to cope with difficult situations in this third part we are going to talk about how to improve well-being at work unfortunately there is no single simple solutions how to address the challenges. Instead, we are uh, describing and introducing you some of our ideas how to uh, approach and improve the well-being at work of nurses. First, we need to see well-being at work as a shared responsibility. 
the responsibility of nurse well-being is shaped between the individual nurses and with those who shape the environment in which they practice. Individual nurses' dedication to their own well-being can be enhanced by support of the system, the leaders and a culture in which well-being is prioritized. We argue that the system approach, which focuses on the structure, organization and culture of workplaces, might be one of the most effective uh, solutions. For individual approaches to be effective, these must be coupled with redesigning organizational processes, structures and policies. Because, for example, for reducing burnout and improving well-being, there is research evidence indicating that these integrated systematic organization-focused interventions are more effective than only individual approaches in use. This figure is, uh, was published by Nasem et al. and it looks on the system model of burnout and well-being. There are external environment, healthcare organization and frontline care delivery factors which uh, uh, causes and can cause burnout and uh, this can be called as work system factors. Each of the individuals have their own uh, mediating factors. And if uh, we are successful, we have professional well-being. However, if we are not that successful, this can end up on clinician burnout. The clinician burnout can have uh, severe consequences, not only the individual her or himself, but also to patients, other clinicians, healthcare organizations, and in the end of the whole society. And the system model starts with an idea of learning and then through learning, improving uh, the system, how it supports the individuals. To uh, use the systemic approach, we need broad range of stakeholders to be included. These include nursing leaders, educational institutions, healthcare organizations, and other employers of nurses, policymakers, and also the professional associations. The actions can include restructuring systems and implementing initiatives to prevent burnout, reduce administrative burden, unable technological solutions to support the provision of care, reduce the stigma and barriers that prevent healthcare professionals from seeking support, and increase investment in research on clinician well-being. There are also these individual uh, uh, interventions, for example, uh, techniques and therapies which can be used to alleviate burnout and stress and increase well-being. Here is some examples, for example, uh, different type of muscle relaxation, breathing, uh, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy and different types of educational programs. One of the modern and popular practice seems to be mindful based uh, interventions. These have uh, shown to have a potential to enhance the well-being of nurses. During the pandemic, uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement published so-called psychological PPE, personal protective equipment. Although the pandemic is uh, the worst part, hopefully, is now over, we do find this still to be very useful as an approach. We can look at it from the team leader uh, perspective. The team leaders can limit staff time on staff, uh, site and shift. We can design more clear roles and leadership. We need to train managers to be aware of the key risk factors, monitor uh, and react on any signs of distress. And one of the, I think, important part of this is the uh, peer support so that we can support one another. So meaning of making peer support services available and introducing so-called body system.
From the individual perspective, it is important for nurses to take that day off and, and look at your work-life balance and that it is uh, optimal. And in exceptional times and stressful times, sometimes it's just good to close the phone and not to read all the news and the publicity around the uh, healthcare. It is important to seek and receive mental health support and to facilitate uh, opportunities to show gratitude. And this means that you need to thank yourself and others. Sometimes there are these negative experiences and it is, it, it is important that we try to reframe them. So learn from them and make the outcomes in the end positive. American critical care nurses published ten, over 10 years ago uh, standards for healthy work environments. Although that these were originally made to critical care nursing context, these have also been adapted to oncology nursing setting and are quite useful uh, approach. And uh, one example of how we could, in a systematic, systemic approach, uh, improve well-being at work. The aim of the healthy work environments is to achieve optimal patient outcomes and clinical excellence. And by investing on creating healthy work environments, we can reach that aim. I recommend if you are interested to, to look at the documents and all the publications which have been made uh, in different care settings, uh, how these have been adapted and used. In this presentation, I will just show you the basic standards, so uh, the main categories, which are the skilled communication. The skills communication refers to professional skills, uh, the communication with the uh, people affected by cancer, but also uh, with the, your colleagues and with the leadership and so on. We need to have a true collaboration genuine through collaboration with its others. We need effective decision making. This needs to be valued and we need committed partners in making the policy and directing and evaluating practice and leading organization operations. Appropriate staffing is important in uh, regards of healthy work environment. The patient equity and staffing must have an effective match. We need meaningful recognition. So we need to be recognizing the staff and must recognize others for value each brings to the work of the whole organization. From the leadership point of view, authentic leadership is uh, one important approach. Nursing leaders must fully embrace the imperative of a healthy work environment, authentically live it and engage others in its achievement. A couple of years ago, uh, EONS uh, published uh, four webinars uh, focusing on safety at work, some of which are, uh, are not only the safety, but it is also uh, on, on uh, culture and effective communication. These are available on our website and please uh, look at look and uh, and uh, I hope that you find these useful. There are also a uh, different language version of these. To conclude, if nurses are not supported in maintaining their physical, emotional and mental well-being, their ability to provide high quality care can be compromised. Looking into the future, we share the opinion that investments are needed to retain the cancer nurses workforce and also that teamwork and togetherness is the key to face challenges together and also to tackle them together. Policymakers, employers of nurses, nursing leaders and educators, professional associations and nurses themselves, we all have a role in ensuring the well-being of the nursing workforce. Thank you for your attention and greetings from Finland.
Thank you and greetings from Croatia. Hello everyone, my name is Alex and I'm a breast medical oncologist from Opitari Viera Chablais in Switzerland and I'm also the European School of Oncology Deputy Scientific Director and Chair of ESCO, the College of the School. Together with my colleague Maha, we'll, we are here at, and thank Oncolor for the invitation to discuss some of the achievements uh, that the European School of Oncology had over the years and particularly focus on one of the courses on improving cancer outcomes and leadership course that we've organized back in 2022. So the European School of Oncology uh, celebrated 40 years this year. It was, it was created by this man, Professor Umberto Veronesi in 1982, with the goal to obtain a reduction of deaths due to late diagnosis or inadequate treatment for cancer. The school is financially independent, therefore it could set up its own uh, priorities. As I told you, we celebrated 40 years this year in a nice event at the Scala in Milano, and this gave us the opportunity to reflect on what has been achieved over the years. The mission of the European School of Oncology is depicted in this, in this slide. We are dedicated to quality education and training because we believe that all patients deserve equal access to competent cancer care. And our vision is that we want to ensure that all cancer patients have access to unbiased and evidence-based competent care from adequately trained health professionals, which means that actually we are focusing on education and we've made a point in trying to uh, um, uh, educate our uh, younger colleagues, especially from countries with limited uh, resources. So what does the school provide? I think we provide a well-structured educational pathway to enhance oncology careers. The goal is to actually help people uh, go from, from the stage of medical student to an oncology professional and to ultimately to become an accomplished oncology leader. And we have certain means that we use to do that. Uh, we historically started with the masterclass, which is a five days immersion into uh, discussions on the main uh, five killers, uh, the, more important, the most important cancer types. We then discovered that it, is, it was important to focus on certain tumor types such as breast cancer or lung cancer to go into, into a more in-depth uh, discussion on those issues. We also understood early on in our development that a placement in a foreign institution outside the country uh, is crucial to be able to develop uh, your career. Therefore, we offered the CTC, the Clinical Training Center Fellowships, which offer a three to six months uh, placement in, in the institution of your choice to um, refine your skills for a certain tumor type. We then developed our postgraduate program uh, that includes uh, certificates of competence in five for five different tumor types of quite intensive programs, two years of uh, in length with uh, where you need to achieve at least 400 credits to be able to obtain a certified diploma from one of the universities with which we collaborate. We then realized that perhaps uh, we need to also um, start earlier and actually give uh, medical students certain uh, elements that would attract them towards an on on a career in oncology. And for some years now, we've been offering the Medical Oncology for Medical Students uh, course. And then this year, we started with the basic oncology course, which focuses on principles that need to be mastered before becoming a um, uh, oncology professional focused on a certain tumor type. All this was well structured and actually um, put in an in a in an in a way to prepare you to, to prepare our our students uh, towards uh, becoming an oncology leader. And we realized that we uh, that being an oncology leader doesn't only only mean to be a good oncologist, but there are certain skills that need to be developed. Therefore, we um, organized uh, earlier in 2022, in, in collaboration with uh, ECHO and SPCC, the first Improving Cancer Outcomes and Leadership. And I will a little bit focus on that uh, uh, for the next minutes. 
mentioning that this is a benefit for those of you who would graduate from the college. We have organized all these events into uh, an educational pathways uh, that constitutes the uh, College of the European School of Oncology. How does it work? The college is div divided into three levels that are reached by earning ESCO credits. Once you are selected for one activity based on competitive application, you would become eligible to become an ESCO student. Once you already achieved 100 points, then you become an ESCO fellow. And in order to become an ESCO graduate, you need to uh, accumulate 500 ESCO uh, credits. How do you accumulate points? It's easy by participating in ESCO activities, courses, fellowships, uh, postgraduate program, EASO sessions, but also by professional achievements outside the school, uh, taking part in two certification exams, publishing, having abstracts at conferences, etc. I would not go into the details uh, of which uh, benefits are available for each level of the college, but I invite you to go on our website and do that. I will just focus that here on, on the bottom of the slide, you see the improving outcomes and leadership course. We believe that once our students have passed through uh, the, the three levels, they deserve to be skilled in something else that only medical oncology. So the target for this course uh, is uh, mid-career oncology professionals who have finished training and have a stable uh, position, um, and they are prepared to take on initiatives and leadership responsibilities. The skills that we want to help them develop is to develop strategic plans, to collaborate in relevant applied health research, to develop implementation approaches to support change management and to influence authorities, governments, and politicians to be able to actually improve cancer care in their uh, own environment. We also promoted through this course sharing of best practices across Europe and also wanted to create a network of trained individuals who will continue to work together to improve cancer patient outcomes. So um, I will briefly uh, describe the course we had in person event plenary sessions and we have also we had also a number of breakout sessions in the uh, event uh, itself um, you see here a number of topics that were discussed um, clinical leadership for effective multidisciplinary cancer care integrative supportive and palliative care how to explain the benefits of a clinical trial to a patient and um, value-based clinical decision-making are just some examples. But what I cannot capture in this slide was the nice atmosphere and the interaction that took uh, place throughout this meeting. Um, participants were, were well, very well um, uh, attracted by, uh, by the subject and they were very active in interacting with the faculty that provided uh, this uh, this. Um, lectures. We also uh, organized four breakout sessions, and in this breakout session, the participants were the ones presenting an example of practice that had changed outcome or did not, um, and they presented their project followed by the discussion with the participants and the faculty members to develop institution country-specific proposals for improving outcomes. Here is just a, a list of some of the topics uh, so from one of the breakout sessions. And also these were an extremely interesting um, experience to realize how much is already done with the existing resources. Um, what have we learned from this project? We have learned that, uh, and from this discussion, that each challenge and project and context is distinct and requires some unique solutions but also that we can do better even within the existing resources. And there are some common themes which suggest some common uh, solution that I will not uh, go into the details. But overall, there are plans to uh, actually use the experience of um, the interaction be uh, during this uh, improving outcomes and leadership course to develop materials for the future. So I think um, the school is very satisfied with this uh, event. I think the participants were very excited. Uh, some of them said it was the best event organized uh, by the school ever. And for that reason, I, I'm, I wanted to share with you that. And actually, I, I'm looking forward to the uh, presentation of uh, my colleague Maha, who will tell you from the perspective of the, of the participant, uh, her experience uh, with the European School of Oncology. Thank you very much for watching. Hello, my name is Maha Al-Sindi. I'm a medical oncologist and a breast specialist. 
working in Salmania Medical Complex in the Kingdom of Bahrain. I'm very honored to be part of the Anqua Alert Colloquium and to be able to present to you my experience in attending the Improving Cancer Outcomes and Leadership course and ESO Eco SPCC European Initiative. First of all, I'd like to discuss with you the reasons I have enrolled with the in the course. Bahrain is a small island in the Middle East with a population just under 2 million. Cancer is one of the leading causes of death in Bahrain and outcomes of patients in comparison to other high income countries are not comparable. Although there have been a lot of progress in the in cancer care in Bahrain with the establishment of Bahrain Oncology Center, we all know as medical oncologists, there is always room for improvement. There are many areas of inequalities in cancer care, and this is a fact that is present worldwide, from prevention to screening, to prompt diagnosis and prompt access to care, to having enough qualified trained physicians and access to multidisciplinary specialized care, to other areas which are not available worldwide or not available in many countries, such as access to clinical trial, research, and innovation. During the course or prior to the course, we were given a task to discuss a project or a proposal that we were involved in or a leadership role that we assumed that led to an improvement or even if it did not, we were asked to discuss the challenges and reasons that the project did not succeed. My proposed project was the establishment of an oral chemotherapy clinic, which was led, which was nurse led. Just to give you a little brief, the current situation in, in the clinic is that patients who require any new oral systemic anti-cancer therapy are briefly educated by physicians in the clinic and then started on oral, chemo, oral systemic anti-cancer therapy after appropriate investigations. This may require multiple visits to start the treatment Furthermore, due to the COVID pandemic, walk-in clinics are no longer in service. Therefore, often patients have trouble reaching the team. This led to the unnecessary visits to the emergency department for routine complaints and, more, and furthermore, constraints on the health system. Therefore, the proposal was to have an outpatient clinic dedicated to manage patients who are starting any new oral anti-cancer systemic therapy. This, was, this would be led by an experienced oncology nurse and a team member in which patients who are starting any new treatment will be educated, given written information, and also have their baseline investigations done. This will be reviewed, approved by the physician prior to treatment. And when patients receive their prescription, the nurse will review the medications again with the patient and or their caregivers and go over ha um, issues related to the administration of the medication, such as how and when to take the prescribed medicine, what to do if doses are missed, explanation of side effects, and as well how to manage them, and how to safely handle the medication. Of course, there are many benefits to having this clinic, such as patients who experience side effects and toxicity will have a direct link with the nurse, and can access the team members easily. It will help improve and manage an adherence and reduce waste at, uh, waste at time of refill. Furthermore, when patients can effectively identify, manage, and report their side effects, their ability to continue the medication for a longer duration improves. Unfortunately, this was not initially accepted or approved by the head of the department. For many reasons, some of them were that it was felt that the nurses were not trained or qualified enough to uh, be able to manage the clinic. We had issue with staffing and availability of rooms in the outpatient department. One of the areas that we discussed in the course is how important it is, how important data is. Therefore, we collected data of the last 12 months of patients who were started or any new anti-cancer systemic therapy or systemic therapy. We also did a survey regarding our proposal to patients to see if this would be accepted. The results of our audit included that 18% were taking the wrong schedule of medication at a given time. 
20% had at least one visit to the emergency department to manage a side effect. 45% of patients reported that they had a side effect that they did not disclose to the physician. And 76% of patients reported that they would feel as satisfied if they were followed by a well-experienced nurse as they would with a physician. Furthermore, 85% reported that they 85% of patients preferred if they had a point of contact or a helpline to, con to contact in case of any um, questions or um, to report any side effects. Once we presented this data again to the head of the department, our proposal was approved. So in front of you, you see the checklist for documentation of oral chemotherapy adherence and toxicity. We plan to monitor after three months of starting this project. And our outcome uh, outcomes would be to um, see the visits to the emergency department, see uh, and also look at toxicity and dose reductions, and also patient reported outcome and overall satisfaction of patients um, with the oral chemotherapy clinic. Other projects that we discussed during our time in the course, I'm just going to discuss some of them. There were many good projects and there was a lot of discussion that was very beneficial. Some of the projects included establishment of a breast cancer unit in Romania. This was presented by a breast medical oncologist. Virtual national tumor board in Albania that was presented by another medical oncologist. Safe and enhanced post-operative cancer pathways presented by an ICU staff nurse from Portugal. Quality of life and cancer-related cachexia presented by a medical oncologist from Egypt. Enhancing patient provider communication through patient education and empowerment at the National Cancer and the National Center of Oncology of Armenia. This was presented by a patient advocate. Establishing a new thoracic surgery department in Greece in the era of financial crisis, which was presented by a thoracic surgeon. Finally, I would like to thank the European School of Oncology for their efforts to provide health professionals like myself with the tools to improve cancer care in an effort to close the care gap worldwide. It is such a pleasure to join today for the third Anchor Alert Colloquium. And thank you, Dr. Gil Morgan, for your remarkable effort of bringing us all together to create a free global educational venue in oncology. I will always fondly remember our first two conferences, AECR and ASCO in 2019, and the small group of dedicated Anchor Alert faculty that quickly made it the top conference influencer. Now, let me review today with you major developments in COVID-19 and cancer. But first, let's review disclosures. None pertain to this talk today. Our COVID-19 research was all a volunteer effort. We have 15 very densely filled minutes, trying to at least touch on all key developments during this ever-changing pandemic. I will let you review this overview at, at your own leisure. I also apologize in advance for the rapid slide speed in order to get through all the key material today in such a brief period. I encourage you to use the video stop function to review the slides at your leisure as you need it. There is a good news story here, of course, science and scientists, medical staff, and government agencies, including Dr. Fauci. And there's also a bad news story I want us all to be aware of. This includes the normalcy bias or normality bias, a cognitive bias which leads people to disbelieve or minimize threats uh, and warnings. Comparing deaths by country with similar age profiles, the US has far more deaths per capita than countries with similar profiles. CDC data in January of 2023, the third year anniversary of this pandemic, deaths are still increasing weekly at 3,900. Hospitalizations are finally declining and total pandemic deaths are now estimated at 1.1 million reached at the end of January in 2023. Prior to reviewing the cancer data, I need to briefly touch on general population, COVID-19 outcomes background. 
The CDC general population data until September 2022 clearly show us vaccines work with ever declining deaths with increasing number of boosters, including the fourth dose. Yet the COVID-19 problem still remains major. It was the third leading cause of death in the US, not only in 2020, and due to limited use of highly effective vaccine boosters and due to the ever-changing viruses, virus and novel variants of concern, COVID-19 still remains also the third leading cause of death for 2021 as well as 2022 and still, away, is still way ahead of accidents, the fourth leading cause of death. Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, told us mid-January this year, COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. are up 79% over the last two weeks, still far below the peaks of the pandemic, but the equivalent of a 9-11 every five or six days. How should we think about humoral versus cellular immunity and its impact on patient outcomes? The New England Journal recently reported, taken together, these data suggest that neutralizing antibodies are primarily responsible for blocking acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 infections, but that both antibodies as well as CD8 uh, T cells responses are critical for preventing severe disease. Fred Hutch, evolutionary virologist, told us SARS-CoV-2 has changed in one to two years more than what, what influenza does in several years. Here's a brief depiction of the ever more rapidly evolving multiple concurrent so-called splintering variants of concerns. And this is a picture of what ev evolutionary virologists keep monitoring in detail, the ever more rapidly a splintering of COVID-19. These are the neutralizing antibodies for the recent novel Omicron variants of concern. Remember BA.5 from this summer, and it's neutralizing antibodies uh, from one versus two monoclonal uh, monovalent boosters seen on the left panel and the middle panel versus on the right panel, the bivalent booster impact on neutralizing uh, antibodies. And now observe the substantial decline in neutralizing antibodies for the latest Omicron. Omicron variants of concern, BQ1.1 and XBB. A single booster essentially has no meaningful efficacy left, and even bivalent booster in the right panel is already challenged. How about complications and long COVID in the general population? Friendly reminder that COVID-19 not only has acute serious cardiovascular and thromboembolic events, but patients also experience it in post-acute phases. I encourage you to check out this paper by Dr. Ortega Paz. As you probably know by now, long COVID can affect nearly every major organ system. And it's nicely reviewed here by uh, Davis uh, and colleagues in Nature Reviews. Long COVID has likely multiple pathophysiologic mechanisms involved. Microthrombi with endothelial dysfunction appear to be consistently present in early studies. Jim Jackson, a Vanderbilt psychologist and director of behavioral health at Vanderbilt, tweeted at the end of January, it is hard to overestimate the impact of cognitive processing deficits. Unfortunately, these seem to be primary difficulties we see in our COVID-19 patients or long haulers who can't think on their feet, can't respond to questions or requests, and cannot keep up. George Monbiot from The Guardian put this in broader context for us in his recent powerful article. We are all playing COVID-19 roulette. The next infection could be, could be the one that permanently disables you. I've been hit three times so far and feel lucky still to be alive and active. But I've lost a little every time, stamina, lung capacity, sleep, and general fitness. To briefly remind you also of the early cancer vaccine studies, the VOICE study uh, looking at inadequate responders by day 28 uh, after two vaccine doses, very promising results, uh, although already um, 16 and 11 percent among chemo and chemoimmunotherapy solid tumor patients had inappropriate responses then already. We learned then very quickly of the challenges, especially among anti-CD20 treated lymphoma patients, where two doses of mRNA vaccines did have near absent immunologic responses. 
But encouraging news even here, 12 months after the anti-CD20 therapy, the vaccine immune response is, al is already much improved. From Dr. Shapiro and team, we learned that the third booster already improved things both in solid tumor and hemolignancy patients, but less so on the hematologic side denoted here in orange. Dr. Shepard at AACR last year taught us that antibody and cellular responses are much reduced with novel variants of concern, the first Omicron at the time, especially again in patients with hematologic malignancies. How about cancer vaccine studies with third boosters? Dr. Mayer in blood uh, 2022 then showed us the limited efficacy of even a third booster among key, among key hem hem malignancies at the immunosuppressed and especially again anti-CD20 treated patients as well as patients undergoing transplantation or stem cell transplantation. The ZeroSnet study um, assessing uh, humoral and cellular responses also confirmed the reduced vaccine response, especially among patients with hematologic malignancies. How about the data in real-world cancer vaccine studies? Dr. Wu, uh, uh, in a very nicely done large VA real world early vaccine period study on breakthrough infections with two mRNA vaccine doses at the time from December 2020 to May 2021, showed us again that concurrent chemo and patients with hemolignancy patients are particularly, hemolignancies are particularly vulnerable. A large UK, a more recent large UK population study with over 370 thousand cancer patients and two doses of mRNA vaccine um, in the Lancet Oncology showed again the effectiveness quickly waning in patients with cancer here in red versus non-cancer patients. Here's the breakdown by major therapies and again anti-CE20 therapy, chemotherapy and leukemia and transplant patients stand out for their reduced and waning vaccine effectiveness over time. The recent CDC MMWR assessment of vaccine effectiveness of two and three mRNA vaccination doses among solid tumor patients in the top row, among hemolignancies in the middle row, and stem cell transplantation patients seen in the lower row, even after three doses, if more than 90 days out. Vaccine effectiveness is much reduced, again, across these three major patient populations already in the solid tumor malignancies in the top row around 60%, he malignancies in the middle row also in the 60% range, and stem cell transplantation in the lower row already at around 30%. Another important VA real-world cancer vaccine study showed the risk for severe COVID-19 with two and three doses of mRNA vaccination vaccination is much increased for chemotherapy as well as cytokine blocking, uh, glucocorticoids, leukocyte inhibitor, as well as lymphocyte depleting therapy. But there's also, again, a good news story here. The VA, this VA team also confirmed if vaccination occurs several months beyond these immunosuppressive therapies are stopped, vaccine effectiveness is nearly fully restored. How about the data from CDC vaccine studies in immune compromised patients during the Omicron phase? Or phases, I should say, the CDC real world vaccine study uh, for the Omicron period until March 2022. Two mRNA vaccine doses had limited effectiveness around 30 to 40 percent. Even for three doses, vaccine effectiveness waned from 80 percent to 50, around 50 percent quite quickly within six months. The more recent vision study of uh, mRNA vaccine effectiveness and hospitalizations among immunocompromised during the Omicron um, BA.2 to until BA.5 showed as expected. We saw very limited effectiveness for three and even three mRNA doses now. And even four doses leaves vaccine effectiveness only around 30 to 40% during these novel variants of concern from the summer already. What does the CDC uh, recommend in terms of prevention for COVID-19 in immunocompromised individuals? Um, these are the summary recommendations for vaccines uh, by product and age uh, in moderately or severe immunocompromised individuals. And they recommend mostly at least a fifth vaccine dose for mRNAs and the fourth dose for J&J vaccinations. 
and the bivalent booster for normal Omicron variants at least two months from the last booster. What do you make of the what do we make of the confusion and database challenges around chemotherapy and neutropenia risk factors? The CDC and IDs are very clear about immunosuppression and COVID-19 risk. They have very clear data and it is that it is a key at risk group with some variability in the spectrum of severity. Co-infections occur in approximately 15 to 20 percent of patients with cancer. 30-day all-cause mortality by COVID-19 co-infection is approximately 25% for bacterial infections, around 34% for fungal infections, and about 9% among patients with absence of co-infection. The covid can registry saw co-infection mortality as high as 35%. Uh, and key uh, risk factors are recent chemotherapy, um, Febal neutropenia, nearly all these patients had co-infections with a multifold increased risk for mortality. Steroid use and potentially also tocilizumab might be risk factors or could be just uh, due to indication bias as these uh, sickest COVID patients also re predominantly receive these medications. So grateful for the shout out from Dr. Otis Brawley in Netscape uh, for our Lancet paper, who also highlighted what we had also highlighted as caveats, both in the abstract as well as uh, in the discussions, particularly in the discussion section. We did not yet have formally uh, assessed specific cancer regimens uh, and therapies, nor in a myelosuppressed period. And also we did not have fully completed key follow-up data. It is also important to note the key limitations of the study suggesting a uh, so-called uh, possible chemoprotective effect for COVID-19 patients. Uh, and what's important to note here, chemo use has indication bias in other key confounders that are not adjusted for in these uh, studies. For example, chemotherapy is given less likely in poor co prognosis patients, such as nursing home and end-of-life patients, frail patients, those with uh, quite severe comorbidities or even uncontrolled comorbidities, low socioeconomic status, and other deprivation indices, etc. And these inherently poor prognosis patients are therefore predominantly found and in, in counted in the so-called non-cancer therapy control arms. These studies also often have only one month cancer therapy uh, information. And this further confounds these analyses as most patients that are on chemo hold due to chemo-associated complications are therefore counted again in the non cancer therapy uh, control arm, further introducing biases in these Key studies that could adjust for some or most of these confounders are listed here. The most limited one is the first study that had limited confounders available and uses a composite variable or composite variables also for assessing cancer therapies that we briefly will discuss further um, and therefore only finds a limited chemotherapy associated severe COVID-19 risk. The Optum Insurance Database study in JAMA Oncology was able to adjust uh, for additional factors such as metastatic disease and nursing home end of life care um, status and had detailed cancer drug information, finding a chemo risk for severe COVID-19, including mortality with an adjusted odds ratio at 1.8 and 2.3 for chemo immunotherapy combination. The most comprehensive study is from Cliff and team who assessed a large UK general population study with detailed information, not only on comorbidities, but also various immunosuppressed states, including various levels of chemotherapy intensity, as well as intense, intensively adjusted for other prognostic confounders, including adjusted for nursing home care and care home status, homelessness, as well as detailed social determinants of health, population deprivation indices, as well, as well as very detailed comorbidity information. For limited intensity chemotherapy, they found an adjusted odds ratio of 2.3, and for more intensive chemotherapy, an adjusted odds ratio of 3.5, and substantially higher risks, not surprisingly, for the most intensive therapy, such as stem cell transplantation, which exactly fits with the limited vaccine effectiveness, as well as the substantially higher mortality risk in these um, patients. 
These findings from Clift uh, uh, and team fit perfectly also with a similar study done just recently completed by a Canadian team and led by Dr. Gong and again published in JAMA Oncology at the end of 2022. This study design is a large population-based cohort study of vaccinated patients with cancer from Ontario, Canada using administrative databases again and they matched over 280,000 vaccinated patients with cancer with over a million matched non-cancer controls. And their findings for SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infections, they found the highest risk, not surprisingly, in patients with hematologic malignancies, as well as those on active therapy, and did not see an obvious increased risk uh, for patients with cancer overall. Uh, their findings uh, for COVID-19 severe disease outcomes, a composite of hospitalization and death. And here, uh, the highest risk in patients, again, not surprising with hematologic malignancies uh, on active therapy hazard ratio of 3.9 and anti-CD20 therapy with a hazard, hazard ratio of over seven. And with a lower risk in patients with solid tumors, except those on active therapy, again, that hazard ratio in that mid uh, two range uh, across therapies. They also found uh, that third vaccine doses um, did reduce breakthrough infections, but not uh, for patients on anti-CD20 therapy. If you have not seen yet, please check out the mass COVID-19 position statement in its clinical criteria to be considered before early discharge of patients with febrile neutropenia. Here, just a brief summary list. You might also appreciate uh, the online UW Medicine Emergency Room Risk Assessment Algorithm for COVID-19. Age, comorbidity, as well as immunosuppression are considered key risk factors. Neutrophilia, a diagnosis, clearly a predictor for severe COVID-19, but is it mainly an epiphenomenon activated by cytokine storm from activated monocytes or a bad actor in its own right? Mild disease appears to only activate monocytes. Neutrophils appear to be recruited by tissue macrophages, especially lung based, and add to the pathology of serious COVID-19 most likely. It does appear both to be an epiphenomenon that probably also turns into a bad actor by the macrophage cytokine storm and contribute to COVID-19 pathology. A neutrophilia um, is a confirmed risk character both in non-cancer and cancer settings. By contrast, neutropenia analysis had its challenges, and especially by missing lab values, as many of these patients did not get labs drawn during, especially during the early pandemic, as well as highly correlated variables, infrared lighter variables in the models, for example, chemotherapy, which is the cause of nearly all the neutropenia in these patients. And this close correlation be, um, that uh, Kamanas Bayanas had also well discussed between uh, here between chemotherapy and neutropenia will make it very difficult to find both variables as independent risk factors uh, once chemotherapy is in the model. What is clear, we already discussed this, both neutropenia and chemotherapy clearly predispose to bacterial co-infection, no surprise, that's a very old finding, nothing new. Um, uh, and uh, it's not surprising that this, of course, also happens in COVID-19 patients, and that has an associated high mortality. Other database challenges that are important to be aware of when assessing COVID-19 cohort studies, the use of composite variables, therefore the absence of a specific risk factor uh, could either mean the true absence or um, falsely missing due to missing values, and then can contaminate the negative control group and that might cause biased results. We already discussed the challenge also of studies with only one month cancer therapy information, as well as the absence of other key prognostic confounders. The neutrophil leukocyte ratio is particularly intriguing. It's a well-known already prior to COVID-19 independent prognostic factor also at baseline prior to any chemotherapy or supportive care use start and is likely a marker of primary immune dysfunction. And uh, we don't know, but might neutrophils be recruited here as um, support uh, antigen presenting cells as has been suggested in a recent exciting uh, cancer immunology study that has the infectious disease world quite uh, interested in, on the cancer side. And it might have elucidated potentially missing uh, mechanisms for neutrophils Despite that limited presence in the mucosa, they are well-known importance for uh, 
mucosal immunologic integrity, as we know so well when you give chemotherapy in one bad neutrophil count uh, above uh, a thousand. Of note, despite their immunologic vulnerable state, neutropenic patients have not been assessed uh, separately, and we discussed the challenges of including the chemotherapy variable in models due to the close correlation. How about the cancer pandemic changes over time? Without having time to go into the details of this study, just know this, we have clear evidence that there are improvements, clear improvements over time, but mainly if patients are vaccinated and of course best if boosted. How about cancer and COVID-19 cords and complication findings? At last year's OncoAlert colloquium, we discussed the increased venous and arterial thrombotic risks. We won't have time to review that again, but know this, that no COVID-19 specific outpatient cancer trial exists uh, for prophylaxis or to confirm risk models, uh, nor expand outpatient prophylaxis. Uh, so be aware the current outpatient prophylaxis guidelines hold true and the corona score is uh, still the standard of care. How about long COVID? The on COVID team found long-term symptoms in approximately 15% of their patients, including respiratory, chronic fatigue, neurocognitive in about 7% 7 of patients and other organ dysfunction. Among their patients on systemic cancer therapy, nearly 15% permanently stopped the cancer therapy, and 38% had some form of dose regimen adjustment, unfortunately. In October, we had the B. 8.5 peak. Only three months later, we literally have these Omicron variants already completely replaced by multiple new variants highlighted by the red box around the last column in December. Forecast of dominant variants of concern by that last week, uh, and it seems to be confirmed now, is, is truly the BQ and XBB variants. And these novel Omicron variants resulting in substantial remaining vulnerabilities, uh, especially again for our patients with cancer. Uh, they are highly contagious. Vaccines are again less effective. F fifth vaccine dose is not su sufficient for many immune compromised any longer and who need likely at least uh, a bivalent sixth vaccine dose now. Monoclonal drugs have reduced efficacy with these newest variants uh, already confirmed. No more preventive measures will be available. More patients will end up again in the hospital. Um, and what is unclear yet, there are also severity changes. In regard to therapeutic drug options uh, against COVID-19, here just a very brief uh, overview uh, of the COVID-19 continuum denoted here in the lower table and from the left, asymptomatic patients towards the right with ever more severe COVID-19. And this is a, a schematic slide to briefly also point out on the left of a box in blue, the drugs targeting the virus, such as antivirals and, and monoclonals antibodies. And to the right of a green box are the immune modulatory drugs that appear to mostly or only work later on during the more severe disease settings around the inflammatory and cytokine storm. This is a summary of COVID-19 preventive agents and outpatient treatments. Please review at your own leisure again during your stop function. Just to point out that monoclonal antibodies are officially now labeled as not effective anymore, both in terms of COVID-19 prevention of novel variants of concern previously uh, was ever shelled, nor as outpatient therapy. This is not good news for our vulnerable patients. Why is this? The slide summarizes the neutralizing activity for monoclonal antibodies for the various variants of concern. Just to briefly highlight, both BQ1 and XBB variants have a more than 100-fold reduction in neutralizing activity. Again, for your brief reference, the key risk factors problem to COVID-19 outpatient therapy. For outpatient antiviral therapy, most important uh, is to remember uh, the resources listed here, how to find Paxlovid drug-drug interactions, which are quite concerning. Also talk to your pharmacist and make a plan before an acute illness occurs for your high-risk patients. How about convalescent plasma? The FDA issued an EUA for immune-compromised uh, COVID-19 patient, COVID patients last year. Briefly, the convalescent plasma history or timeline here, it has quite a checkered history. During the 1918 flu pandemic, there was suggestion or rather question if it helped. Early during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were retrospective cohort studies suggesting its benefit in non-immune compromised as well as immune compromised um, 
uh, when pooled uh, across studies, the R tracers were quite identical among these retrospective studies uh, for immune compromised and uh, immune comp competent patients. But all these studies uh, were either biased and not adjusted for such as socioeconomic confounders, uh, healthcare access, and other time biases. Uh, they could easily explain uh, this benefit uh, that was observed. Blood bank shortages of blood products also made the medical use of unconfirmed convalescent plasma at the time particularly challenging. All large phase three randomized trials were originally negative, including a large geriatric trial, which uh, particularly had early convalescent plasma use and high titer. Um, some smaller studies were positive, but um, probably are not considered phase three in design. And they had imbalances of prognostic factors or other major methodologic limitations that made them somewhat questionable. And other studies showed, some studies showed concerning variants of concern, mood and evolution on convalescent plasma. Then came compelling case reports of super high titer convalescent plasma after vaccination, rescuing failed high titer immune compromised patients. And then there was one positive phase three study from Hopkins in general outpatients, so not even limited to immune compromised patients. Uh, and the FDA then issued an EUA, but it is limited to the immune compromised outpatient in inpatient setting and then allowing it in combination with other drug therapy options. So we just discussed the convalescent plasma history. It's considered a complement to other antiviral medications. RC randomized control trials in immune compromised patients are lacking, at least on the phase three level. And it's still not broadly available in US blood banks. It would be so valuable to understand its true efficacy also to ensure broader availability. Convalescent plasma, what do the guidelines say? In immune competent, if hospitalized, it is recommended against, given the adverse safety and signal seen in randomized control trials in these patients. But in immunosuppressed, if generally is recommended now, uh, even in the absence uh, of randomized trials, given the vulnerability of these patients. Other major unmet needs we discussed uh, last year, the oncoalloid colloquium, these unmet needs, they're still somewhat, uh, to a lesser degree, a concern. In the interest of time, I want to briefly uh, just highlight the need to upgrade air filtration in public spaces, the need for um, uh, reliable immune correlates to identify the unprotected individuals despite extensive booster use, and the need for additional preventive strategies, again, monoclonals for the novel variants. And George Monbiot, again from The Guardian, recently wrote this powerful impertinent piece on air quality, which I think will be key. One study found that the mechanical ventilation systems in classrooms reduces the infection risk by uh, over 70%. The virus thrives in badly ventilated shared spaces, spaces, especially classrooms. And there's a powerful argument uh, that just as cholera was stopped by cleaning the wa water, that COVID will be stopped by cleaning the air most likely. And at last year's Uncle Alert Colloquium, we also reviewed the physical and mental challenges of medical staff and trainees alike. And a plea, therefore, to leaders, please work on reducing staff overboarding and understaffing. It is more critical than ever, as we also now have a concurrent burnout pandemic simultaneously ongoing now. How about disparities? Unfortunately, we do not have time to review in detail uh, from last year either. Just want to refer you to our Lancet Oncology editorial and position paper uh, and piece on the haunting spotlight than the pandemic uh, placed on our societal shortcomings as well as the harm from prematurely invoking biology when social determinants of health explain the disparities in health conditions predisposing as well as ensuring adequate access to care and uh, that then mostly resolve the disparities. The Optum data we review, review, reviewed last year from a comorbidity standpoint, as well as the impact of chemotherapy and other cancer therapies on severe COVID-19. Let me also point out uh, the pertinent data it gives us on regional disparities. The US South overall saw double the mortality from COVID-19 compared to Midwestern regions. Uh, the EU Commissioner von der Leyen pointed out very early on during the pandemic, which remains true to the end of the pandemic, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. 
and uh, again, an urge to help maximize global vaccination efforts. And is this the never ending pandemic? It should not be. We have all the necessary mitigation tools at this point. The disturbing question is now really, uh, will we use them wisely or will our worst angels win and keeps making us stumble with highly suboptimal measures? And somewhat is the false sense of normalcy. Last but not least, to briefly summarize, maximize vaccination, bivalent boosters, and especially wing protection uh, for the most vulnerable individuals, at least yearly updated boosters. Might there be potentially even a bi-yearly option for the most vulnerable? That would be amazing. Vaccine uh, awareness uh, of concern are ever more rising with ever reduced vaccine efficacy, masking, physical distancing, and testing before gatherings will help although remain imperfect still. COVID-19 therapy, ensure easy access to therapy, especially for high-risk patients and make a plan now for the most vulnerable. Supportive care, please give per guidelines of nature societies. And the prediction is now only if we tackle air quality in public spaces in particular and routine vaccinations also for the global community will be all, will we all be reasonably safe. Thank you all for joining us today today. Please stay safe and well. And a particular thank you to the amazing patient advocates who keep teaching and enriching us. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for joining us on this Encore Colloquium. We hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we have enjoyed making it and reminding you that this week was just the beginning. We want to make sure that these presentations reach every oncologist worldwide, and that this information is used. It is for this reason that we have made it easy and possible to share the links. You can just copy paste the YouTube links and there is no sign up. You can also go to our website at oncolert360.com and find the links there. No tracking of data, there is no registration, precisely because we feel information should be easy to access and available for all. Thank you very much on behalf of Oncolert, our partners, our faculty, and reminding you that no matter where you are, we're all on Coalert.